I am Maggie Moore. I am a planner at PSRC in our growth management group. Uh, and good morning. Today we are doing our Passport to 2044 session on coordination with tribes. And this is one of many Passport to 2044 sessions we are hosting at PSRC uh, in partnership with the Department of Commerce. We have held six sessions so far. If you have not been able to make these sessions, they're all recorded and available on our website. Uh, and we have, after today, five more sessions coming up throughout the rest of the year. So we have one later this month on planning for critical areas, in December, one on TOD and centers, uh, and then we have um, one on housing in early 2023, and we're planning for another one on equity, is one specific, as well as one specific to elected officials and planning commissioners. So more information on those later ones to come out uh, later this year. Uh, today, specifically for our session on coordination with tribes, uh, we're starting out with this introduction, then I'll pass it to staff from the State Department of Commerce, who will talk about tribal participation and state guidance on that. Then we are really happy to have a local example, so we have staff from the Puyallup tribe, as well as the city of Fife, to talk about their work coordinating um, and best practices for that from their perspectives, uh, as well as um, some resources from PSRC. And then we're going to open it all up to a Q&A from all of our presenters. So if you have any questions throughout today's event, please add them um, into the Q&A you should see on Zoom. Um, and just more logistics. So in addition to that Q&A, we are recording today's session. So if you um, know of someone else who may benefit from the session, we should have that posted within a week, and we will send out the recording next week to everyone who registered for today's event, and feel free to share that. Also, at the end, we um, will, you'll be prompted to take our Title VI survey, which is just has some questions on demographics, so we have a better understanding of who's attending these events. Uh, and for our Passport to 2044 series, this is really part of PSRC's work program to support the development and update of your local comprehensive plans. We really want to create resources to help you um, develop great local plans that really embody the key policy themes from Vision 2050. So Vision 2050 is really a regional resource that sets direction um, for the planning work in our four county region. And these passport sessions are really helping to um, share some of those ideas that have come out of Vision 2050, as well as direction and things that we're hoping to see in this next round of comprehensive plan updates. Uh, also, as a resource, I want to point out PSRC's plan review manual. So this really provides a checklist of things um, that are new that we'll be looking for in comprehensive plans and things we're hoping that are incorporated in there based on that regional policy direction. We have many resources on that plan review manual as well as a webinar that was recorded in June 2021. If you are unfamiliar with the tool and want more information about it, this is all available on our website. And we also have a series of other PSRC guidance and resource documents specific to different topic areas for comprehensive plans. So later today, Erica Harris will talk about our guidance on tribal coordination, which is part of this list, but we also have many other topics here, um, as well as more that we're working on from PSRC. So thank you for joining us today. I am going to pass it off to Ben Sir from the Department of Commerce to talk about House Bill 1717 and planning requirements under GMA. All right, thank you, Maggie. Let me see if I can share my screen here. How does that look? Looks great. Great. So good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Sir. I'm the Eastern Regional Manager in Growth Management Services at the Department of Commerce. I am also an enrolled member of the Estamumeca Maidu Tribe of Enterprise Rancheria in California. And I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Spokane people. Um, what I'm talking about this morning is some changes to the Growth Management Act as it pertains to tribal participation. Um, 
Department of Commerce has over 200 different programs, but we're over here in the planning portion here at Growth Management Services. I sometimes hear people say uh, commerce is like the junk drawer of state agencies, and that's why we have so many different programs. So I'm going to be talking about uh, substitute House Bill 1717. But before I get into that, I want to touch on what the Growth Management Act required in terms of tribal participation prior to this bill. And really, it wasn't a whole lot. There are there were noticing provisions, and these are important because the noticing provisions haven't changed. And really, that still requires uh, local governments to plan in their public participation program a way to, to notice tribes for changes to their comp plans and development regulations. Uh, countywide planning policies, tribes were mentioned. I'll get into that a little bit later, but it basically said tribes may be included in the uh, development of countywide planning policies. And then we've got a couple down here, uh, a bonus points for some uh, uh, funding program. And then uh, the voluntary stewardship, which was added to the GMA quite a bit later, but was a lot more thoughtful about how tribes were included in that process. And so you can see it touches on a lot more sections of the GMA. So where did this bill come from? It arose from the roadmap to Washington fu Washington's future, which was an uh, a process to look at the entire framework of planning in Washington state, not just the GMA. And so this bill made six changes to the Growth Management Act and it went into effect earlier this year on June 9th. So before I get too far into this, I, I should say that Tribes are not subject to the Growth Management Act, and I think that's one of the reasons why they were largely um, not really addressed very much in the past. But uh, it's become clear that there's need for more uh, participation and integration of tribes in the planning process, and so that's why this bill came about. So the first section that's altered is uh, 040, and this is the portion of the GMA that talks about who must plan and the summary of requirements. So they, these new provisions allow tribes to participate in the local planning process. And how this works is a tribe needs to provide a resolution to the local government indicating they would like to coordinate. This is limited to federally recognized tribes with a reservation or ceded lands within the county. So you can't have a tribe that's you know, way far away um, and and indicate that they want to be involved in the local planning process if, if they're you know, on the other side of the state. So the tribe and the county will develop a memorandum of agreement as to how they're going to work together through the planning process. And if agreement cannot be reached, commerce can supply a mediator for a period of 30 days and that can be extended by one additional 30 day period and either party can extend this period. So up to 60 days of mediation to try and develop a memorandum of agreement. Uh, if at the end, um, they can't come to an agreement on what that memorandum should look like, um, there isn't a requirement that the local government um, go any further with that. Um, there will just not be a memorandum of agreement. So the next section of the law that was changed was port elements. So port elements, there are a few um, jurisdictions across the state that are required to have a port element in their comp plan. And this changes the language in that so that tribes have been added to develop uh, the plan collaboratively between the city, the port, and the tribe. So I know that there's, um, Andrew may talk about this later, because he's one of those, he works for one of those tribes that uh, this pertains to, 
but it's a relatively small subset of jurisdictions that are required to develop a port element. So 3670A106, this is the next section that has been changed. And this is submittal to commerce for review. What has been added here are requirements for the Department of Commerce to provide uh, submittals to tribes when requested. And so how we're doing this is we have uh, made changes to our plan view data system. So this is where most of you will be submitting your, your plans and development regulations to Department of Commerce. And we are utilizing this so that tribes can now sign up to receive notice based on which jurisdictions they're interested in or which types of submittals they're interested in or both. So we launched this update to plan view uh, earlier this year, uh, about a month ago. And we're still coordinating with tribes to uh, make them aware of this ability to sign up in plan view and um, coordinate with them so that they can start receiving the uh, submittals when they come in that they're interested in. The next section is 3670A110. This is the section on urban growth areas. So the new requirement here is that local jurisdictions are to work with tribes to coordinate urban growth. And so tribes must opt in under the previous section that we talked about in developing the memorandum of agreement on 040. And again, it's limited to federally recognized tribes with a reservation or ceded lands in the county or city. I think one of the reasons for this change is that we had seen uh, the GMA getting in the way of tribes and local governments working together. Uh, one example of this was a city who had uh, tribal lands adjacent to their city. And the tribe and the city wanted to work together so that the city could extend sewer services um, to the tribal lands that were right next door um, because it was a win-win for them. It was, they could get more, the city could get more customers and the tribe could get sewer service. However, the, the land in question, uh, the tribal land in question was outside of the urban growth area. And this precluded the city from extending sewer services outside of, of the urban growth area. And so that was problematic. And we've seen this uh, in several, several parts of the state. So I believe that this change about urban growth areas now allows tribes to coordinate um, for for partnering with local governments on provisions of urban services, at least in part. There could be more to that as well. The next section that was changed is uh, 3678190. And this is the section on technical assistance, procedural criteria, grants, and mediation services. And I think. This is probably the biggest change uh, to, to the GMA as part of this bill. And it requires commerce to provide facilitation services. And how that happens is tribes may request assistance from commerce to resolve issues related to proposed changes to local comp plans and development regulations. And so what this means is, is if a tribe sees something that they have concerns about or are taking issue with, they can reach out to Department of Commerce to let us know. And when they do that, we notify the local government that this pauses their ability to adopt that plan or regulation for 60 days. You see, unless agreement is reached. So how agreement may be reached is, um, commerce will uh, coordinate with the tribe and transmit those concerns to the jurisdiction. And the jurisdiction can choose to uh, alter their plans or regulations based on uh, what, they, what they understand from the tribe. Or they can uh, go in to 
a, I'm going to go back for a second, this uh, uh, mediation. So this is the second portion that uh, allows for mediation to occur. And this will be a 60 day period um, and commerce will supply the mediator. And at that, the end of that 60 day period, um, if, if it's not extended, so this, this period, this facilitated mediation period can be extended beyond the 60 day period if both parties agree. Um, if both parties do not agree and that the 60 day period ends, the local government may then proceed with adoption of their plan or regulation. Um, one other component of this is that during this time, the local government will not be penalized for uh, penalties for non-compliance. So if you've applied for funding and this takes you over the deadline for the update, for example, um, there will not be any penalty associated with that. And then the last portion that was changed was 3678-210. So this is the countywide planning policies. And this changed the language from may to shall, I believe. And so uh, the counties are required now to reach out to tribes with a reservation or ceded lands in the county to participate in the update of countywide planning policies. And if the tribe decides to participate, then they, the county must work to develop policies for the protection of tribal cultural resources um, in that case. Uh, just one little side note to this, uh, because of the language in 210 and how they changed it, it also requires counties to reach out to federal agencies to participate in the countywide planning policy. I'm not quite sure if that was intended, but that is how it reads now. So those are all the changes to the GMA as it relates to tribal participation. Commerce has several next steps to do associated with this change in the law. And so the first one that we have now completed was to update the plan view data system to allow tribes to sign up and receive notice through that system. We are also working on hiring a tribal planning coordinator. I'm hoping that we will get that position posted sometime before the end of the year. Um, but it could be that it extends out into January, but we are hoping to get that person hired soon because we need to stand up our program uh, as it relates to tribal participation so we can help all of you, the local governments, and also the tribes with technical assistance on this issue. We're also in the process of, of contracting with a facilitation services provider. As you saw, the timelines associated with this are very short 30 day and 60 day timelines. And so we need to have a facilitation services provider uh, already uh, contracted. So as soon as those requests come in, we can um, get, those, get those out to, to folks and start that, that, that facilitated me, uh, mediation. Um, obviously, if we had to go through an RFP or RFQ process every time one of these came in, we wouldn't be able to hit those timelines. And so we're hoping to have that RFQ uh, out here again, hopefully before the end of the year. We also need to develop guidance on this and possibly rulemaking. We also need to develop web resources because we don't have any at this point. And there's a lot that, that we should have. And right now we're leaning on other agencies' websites to help provide some of this information. And I've got some examples of that in a moment. And again, we also need to begin outreach to the tribal governments to inform them about this change in the law and provide them technical assistance on how they may be able to utilize this to participate in coordination with planning with local governments. 
So a lot of work on our plate to do still. So here are just some uh, state resources for tribal planning. So this is a map that shows um, tribal reservations. And you can see here draft, treaty, seated areas. This is a map from Department of Ecology and the link is there at the bottom. Um, I want to I want to focus on that draft treaty seated areas because the, I think this is a best guess. Um, but obviously, uh, we didn't have surveyors that were out there surveying these lands when these treaties were written. And so um, this, this is open to interpretation. So I, I'd say if you're near any of these areas, you may want to check in with those tribes regardless, even if it looks like you're outside of an area. Um, this is useful for identifying which treaties you should be looking at. And um, moving on here, I want to come down to this Department of Fish and Wildlife. Their um, website is really good because they cross-reference. They've got a table on their website there that shows, you know, if this is the treaty, these are the tribes um, that were involved or the descendant tribes. Um, that were party to those treaties. So it helps you cross-reference, all right, this is where I'm at in terms of the map. These are the, the tribes that were involved and so you know who to reach out to. Um, going back up to the top here, the Governor's Office of Indian Affairs has a lot of good information, uh, including more information on uh, treaties. Uh, Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation has uh, tribal consultation information. And the Department of Transportation has a really good website in terms of contacts. And so if you go to that, it's, it's a little bit confusing because at the top of it, it's all DOT contacts. But as you continue to scroll down, they've got contacts for uh, tribes. And oftentimes that includes planning staff at those tribes. And so if you're looking to get in touch with a planner at the tribe, that's a really good resource. We are going to hope to develop uh, resources for our own website that pertain to all of these things. So you don't have to kind of hunt and peck through all these different uh, state agency websites to find the information you need, but that's a little ways out for us at this point. And that is it for me. And I'm going to be handing it off to my colleague, Michelle. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Ben. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Gladstone Wade, and I lost my Zoom window. Um, I am the tribal liaison for the Department of Commerce, and I am here to share just kind of a brief update on where the department as a whole is at with tribal engagements. Just trying to get my screens to play nice here. So I have just a real quick uh, PowerPoint just to give us a visual to, or a bit of a map through where the department is at in terms of updating and working, updating our policy and working with our tribal partners. So a uh, predecessor to our tribal engagement policy outlined a committee uh, the Commerce Tribal Advisory Committee. And this committee will serve as our formal means of communication with tribal leadership. And the contact has been defined as a gathering of commerce leadership being Director Brown and tribal leaders and providing a space to identify issues in common and discussing strategies to address them. Uh, we will be meeting two times a year and ComTAC will have the authority to establish subcommittee task force and what have you in order to address specific um, needs and interests of the group. We did host our inaugural meeting um, in August of 2022. And from in follow up, we are working on developing bylaws uh, to stand up the group formally, in which case we will start the discussion of a formal tribal engagement policy between the Department of Commerce and our tribal partners. 
Uh, this slide here is more of a visual. I don't, I don't, hopefully, you don't want to read all of the 12 point font, um, but this is a graphical or a visual representation of all the different uh, legislative requirements that the Department of Commerce has to engage with tribes in one way or another. So, we have six different requirements, and um, 1717 is on the right hand side of the screen here the tribal coordination and GMA. And so in the updating of our tribal engagement policy, uh, we will be weaving in the requirements of all of those six uh, pieces of legislation. We'll also be working on an internal process where our staff will have the opportunity for regular place-based education uh, that will be reflective of the tribes that surround the commerce, either headquarter or hub, which they work out of. We will be determining the different levels of tribal engagement. Um, from coordination and conversation from a program level up to the formal engagement with Director Brown and the tribal leadership. There will be extensive opportunities to learn when each level is appropriate and how to engage um, with each level. And of course, we want to be able to utilize the CompTAC group as an opportunity to receive feedback from the tribes on our performance. And of course, the uh, any, any conversations that may go through program level staff, um, any coordination, none, none of this is intended to be a replacement for government to government consultation. And so I, since 1717 isn't a large requirement in terms of commerce as of um, agency working with the tribes, just wanted to provide a quick update of where we are going. And if you have any questions or concerns about the tribal engagement policy as it develops, um, I'm absolutely happy to help answer those. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and hand it over to Andrew. Thanks, Michelle. Give me one second here. Can everybody see that? Yes, that looks great. All right. Um, Yake Yagayi, good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Strobel. Uh, I'm the director of planning and land use for the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Um, I'm also a citizen of the Central Council Clinket and Haida Tribes of Alaska. Um, Today I'm presenting on the traditional lands of the Puyallup Bopsh people, also known as the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Uh, today I'm going to go over a small bit of tribal history for tribes in Washington State. Um, there will be much to be left to be desired on this section, but I want folks to understand that tribes were the original sovereigns of this territory and still are today. Many steps were taken to disenfranchise tribes from this authority over land and many measures uh, to reclaim those um, authorities over fisheries issues, cultural resource issues, have been historic fights tribes have been waging to ensure that their rights have been protected. The legacy of where tribes are and their status as sovereigns has varied throughout time. This section, I hope, will provide some light context of where tribes have come from in a land use lens. Uh, tribes have been here since time immemorial. Uh, also, you know, what does that mean? It means since anyone can remember. They were the original inhabitants of Washington State. Upon contact in Washington State, many of the federally recognized tribes uh, were under duress from the United States government and signed treaties to cede their territory in exchange for reserves and certain rights con contained in each treaty. Many of these rights transcend the borders of these reserves into what are called usual and accustomed areas and stations. Most of these treaties were signed in the mid 1850s. As a footnote, the map that you see here is a rough estimate of what tribes ceded what areas of lands. And I will also note that some tribes were not included in treaties and were not recognized and were recognized by presidential executive order or Congress and you won't see those lands portrayed in most maps. Out of the secession of lands in Washington State. Um, this ultimately allowed for the creation of cities and in county, counties to incorporate. 
the ongoing settlement of Washington State and the strategic importance of where tribal reservations were located forced local authorities to appeal to the federal government to open up tribal reservations for settlement. A series of carve outs of these lands included congressional action, illegal sales, federal commissions to move for disillusion of reservation land, negligence by uh, regulatory agencies, and even the murder of certain tribal members to force the sale of their property. Before the more modern form of land ownership, tribes enjoyed land communally. Depending on tribes, uh, or depending on the tribes, uh, uh, there were family, clans, matriarchal structures of governance that would help resolve conflict over land. The establishment of reservations largely moved this communal structure of ownership management to sole ownership and allotment. In the 1980s to the 1930s, these allotments were that were earlier described were sold off illegally in many instances, going through a series of rule changes with little opportunity for tribes to react and tribal members to defend their interests. Frequently, trustees interested uh, in, in the land that they were represented to, uh, to, to represent individuals would profit off of um, the transaction and the sale of those members' lands. These dealings in the disintegration disintegration of reservations largely created a checkerboarded uh, slate of lands where some lands were owned by non-Indigenous ownership and some were still owned by tribal members and tribes. As tribes were recognized as governments in, uh, in 1934 under the Indian Reorganization Act, um, many tribes developed constitutions. It became one of the first times that tribes could effectively defend their interests um, as a body. There would be several tribes in Washington state that would not be recognized for decades later. Tribes effectively for most of the later half of the 20th century, 20th century would fight for defending their treaty rights, the fishing wars, the Bolt decision, um, and, and other fights associated from tribe to tribe uh, would largely play out. Tribes had few options to fund their governments, like conventional local governments uh, that use taxation and other fee structures to, to fund their government. Um, most all tribal authority was determined through Congress or the Supreme Court, uh, through the Supreme Court decisions. In 1988, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, also known as IGRA, uh, provided the foundation for tribes to, uh, particularly in Washington state, to establish compacts with the state um, to create casinos and generate revenue to begin purchasing land back, develop infrastructure, and begin regulating their land bases. And since the passage of the Growth Management Act in 1990, cities and counties have largely been planning over tribes and in, uh, in their uh, lands, sometimes when it's very apparent that those cities and counties have no jurisdictional authority. Since then, tribes have taken shape to develop more regular regulatory structures like planning departments and different codes um, to just like cities and counties. While tribes are not required to plan under GMA, they do have the sovereignty to determine through their own growth patterns and development on, on their lands. Tribal authorities uh, over land are not static and frequently put into refocus by the Supreme Court. Recently, the McGirt decision, which was watched closely uh, by many, um, were uh, where tribes uh, in the state of Oklahoma were found that the that Congress had never diminished their reservations and that the Eastern half of Oklahoma would still be considered as Indian country. Tribes in Washington state will continue to support their own self-determination and grow, develop and protect their traditional way of life. I want to talk a, a little bit about the tribe I work for and their unique circumstances and how they are working with the city of Fife on several different initiatives. <clears throat> Um, the map on the left is the original Puyallup, uh, well, I should say this is the 1864 uh, survey boundary that largely encompasses the Puyallup Reservation, and each square represents um, an uh, individual allotment um, given to a tribal member when the reservation was established. Um, and like sort of I had explained earlier is uh, the map on the right um, is a, the, a map of the reservation overlaid with all the different cities that uh, encompass the or, or have annexed in 
within the Puyallup Reservation. You have the city of Tacoma, you have the city of Fife here that's fully encompassed within the reservation, parts of Pierce County, Milton, Edgewood, and Puyallup. And so you can see through the disillusionment of, of tribal lands that um, collaboration is a really important part for the tribe to um, ultimately work with local jurisdictions so it can grow. Uh, let's go here. In 1989, the Puyallup tribe, federal government, Washington state, the city of Fife and several uh, additional governments signed the Puyallup land claim settlement. Largely resolved, <clears throat> this, this agreement largely resolved some land disputes on the Puyallup reservation. The tribe was winning several court cases related to the illegal transfer of lands that I spoke of earlier. Um, this uh, result, this was related to title companies that had stopped insuring their deeds, uh, which caused huge problems in the non-tribal community in, in, in land transfer. There were several concessions made by the governments to get the tribe to agree to the settlement that I won't go into, but uh, one of the important mechanisms of the agreement that emerged was uh, a consultative process when managing major land use decisions. The decisions would extend not to just permits, but long range plans like comp plans and anything else requiring a hearing. The tribe and local jurisdictions would be notified when these de decisions were taking place and had the opportunity to consult on them. When there would be disagreement, the agreement uh, outlined a process to engage communicating these issues uh, and facilitating a government to government co uh, consultative process. While the settlement agreement provided and, and established a process of last resort and baseline protection for parties to consult with each other, it did not provide the elements of how a tribe and a local government could proactively work together. Only through lessons of past conflict coupled with recognizing the tribe and local governments had much to gain did we finally start working proactively in, in local planning. Um, these, I, I'm going to go over some specific projects uh, that we've been working, particularly with the city of Fife on, um, that is an example of this proactive uh, relationship. Two major projects happening on the Puyallup Reservation are the WashDOT SR-167 project, also known as the Gateway Project, and the Sound Transit TDLE. Um, we, uh, th these are major infrastructure projects on the Puyallup Reservation, and um, and our ability to work with the city of Fife um, and really vision what we want to see on the reservation and within the city limits of the city of Fife um, is an example of, of partnership and, and really working to um, see how this project interfaces on, on the reservation. Um, the, uh, let's see here. Um, these projects are will transcend local boundaries between the tribe and Fife. Um, they uh, allow us, our partnership allows us to relay concerns and general interests to the project developers, which are WashDOT and Sound Transit on these projects. And overall, I think it's a win-win for us um, to really advocate for each other uh, in, in, in transportation planning. Uh, when our needs are sort of in alignment and articulated well. Um, another subject that we collaborate with Fife on is uh, fisheries resource planning. We work on critical area code, code enforcement for illegal dumping, um, mitigation design for watershed that goes to the city of Fife and beyond. Uh, Fife has the Puyallup River to its southern border, Wapato Creek that comes out of the Blair Waterway in the port, and the Hylobos Creek that comes from the Hylobos Waterway in the port of Tacoma. Um, they go entirely through Fife. <laughs> um, salmon exist in each of these streams and rivers, and tribal members actively practice their treaty fishing rights on the Puyallup River. Fife is sort of ground zero for how salmon are going to eventually reach their traditional spawning grounds. Culvert replacement, protecting the critical area, stormwater management of local development are issues that we regularly collaborate over. Um, Fife isn't, as I had mentioned, is entirely encompassed by the Puyallup Reservation, has several traditional village sites within its city boundaries. We work closely with the city on avoiding uh, impacting these areas by requiring um, 
the commission of cultural resource surveys, inadvertent discovery plans, and establishing communication and notification protocols to deal with projects that are sensitive in nature. We are working on a heat map with Fife to advise developers of the likelihood of impacting those resources without showing where they are. Tribes are very sensitive to sharing cultural resource information. We are collaborating on several other planning efforts. Fife is updating their comp plan right now. The tribe is developing our first uh, comprehensive plan. Um, we work intergovernmentally on issues at PCRC and PSRC uh, and local planning uh, uh, initiatives like the Tacoma Tide Flats Subarea Plan. Uh, Fife is working to establish their own town center plan, and we've also been working to address much of the needed transportation infrastructure in Fife by lobbying together to make sure that those needs are met. Um, I'll finish by providing some key insights uh, for you, uh, for you all. Um, you know, it's very important to establish points of contact with your local tribes, even if you're not near a reservation, there will likely always be cultural resource uh, watershed planning issues related to fisheries near you most most likely. Um, it's important to notify tribes of uh, your planning initiatives early. I can't reiterate this enough. Um, you know, the uh, typically a lot of plans have are scoped for a certain timeline. Getting tribes involved, if you want them involved in the process, um, you know, will sometimes take some extra time. And so, really providing that pre that advance notification, I think, is really important. Um, consider formalizing your relationship with tribes to reduce liability and promote collaboration. Um, that's through the opportunity of uh, like the legislation outlined in 1717, um, interlocal agreements, MOUs. Uh, there's a lot of mutual benefit in, in formalizing this and not having it just be based off of the relationship of the people who are in the room at that point in time. Um, tribes are not stakeholders and should be treated as sovereign governments uh, where we are invited to the table, uh, where we are invited at the table with who does matter. Most spaces have not traditionally been friendly to tribal interests, so be mindful who you're inviting to the table with tribes. And finally, some tribes lack resources to collaborate on everything, and some will not prioritize it. Um, each tribe is different uh, in their approach based off of their needs. But understanding what those needs are and the and, and initiating some effort to uh, establish a relationship is important. Having no relationship will traditionally re lead to problems. Um, those are just a couple things in the short amount of time I'm able to share with you. But um, you know, I thank you for uh, attending today, and I will turn this over to uh, Chris from Fife. Chris, we're having trouble hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, and your screen looks great. Perfect. So much. My name is Chris Larson. I'm the Assistant Community Development Director with the City of Fife, and I'm here today to give you a kind of a local jurisdiction's perspective on coordinating with tribal partners. Too far. I'm sitting at the base of that red arrow in Fife City Hall, and in the of Fife, we are fully within the tribal reservational boundary, but more importantly, the entire city of Fife is on the ancestral homelands of the Puyallup tribe. In my presentation today, I want to give you a brief overview of quote-unquote history. Um, Andrew touched on a lot of that, and then focus a little bit on the land settlement agreement, which is the city of Fife's formal agreement um, with the tribe, and, and focus on that concept of consultation. And then talk about a few lessons learned and then uh, look at some of the benefits of having a close um, productive partnership with your local tribal partners. Before we get too far in, um, Andrew mentioned that this concept of time immemorial and what it means to tribes is it is since anyone can remember. Um, I would I would the way I contextualize it is, is a little bit differently, but I think it's still consistent is that before there were any before. Um, Tribal people were on these lands, there were no people on these lands. That helps me, you know, together with our understanding of human habitation of, of our planet, um, that puts it into a much bigger, broader timeline and perspective. 
And in contrast to that, um, the Growth Management Act adopted you know, a little bit more than 30 years ago puts us into nice, easy 20-year chunks. We're just going into the second half of the second chunk of 20 years. So just to give you some timelines of where we sit in terms of our relationships, um, tribes have been here since time immemorial and have a lot more history and background than, than the rest of us in this area. Fast forwarding from time immemorial on to 1854 when the Treaty of Medicine Creek was signed. This was the mechanism that created the Puyallup Indian Reservation. Um, there were some changes in the following years which resulted in the boundary that is in effect today at approximately 18,000 acres. In 1887, Andrew mentioned the, the Dawes Act or the General Allotment Act. Um, this, is the, this was the mechanism that split the reservation into individual ownership. It is worth for us knowing as municipal planners that that was the first time that a lot of tribal, that most tribal people were introduced to the concept of land ownership. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, it resulted in a lot of confusion and ultimately resulted in the vast majority of tribal allotments no longer being in tribal ownership. I um, mean, and for my part of the conversation, I want you to know that if you do have original allotments in your jurisdiction, those do hold incredible importance to the tribe and you should be aware of them and aware of the, their location as well. Enter Fife. Um, Fife Incorporated in 1957, um, 70 years after the Allotment Act and over 100 years after the, the Treaty of Medicine Creek at original incorporation, we were about the the western third of this green uh, green outline here, um, just shy of 1,500 people and about 1,250 acres. In Fife, there's three different classifications of property, and I saw this in the chat. Um, trust property, that property that is in trust, um, it's held by the federal government in trust for either the Puyallup tribe as a nation or for individual tribal members. Um, that's that first classification of trust property. There's also property that's not in trust. It has not yet gone through that process with the federal government to be for it to be placed in trust. And it could be owned by the Puyallup tribe as a nation or by individual tribal members. That category of not in trust, but owned by the tribe or a tribal member kind of carries a unique, um, unique area as well when it comes to regulating property. And there's parcels and land that is neither of the above. This is the, this is the standard. Um, parcel that is applicable to our Fife Municipal Code and all other county, state, and, and regulations. As of 2020, our population had increased fivefold and we tripled our land area. Um, as Andrew mentioned, in those first years and leading up to the, the settlement agreement, there were plenty of concerns, consternations, fights, and probably worse. Um, again, that's not really my history to tell. I'm not gonna really focus on that part of the history too much. Um, but the main point of the land settlement agreement is that there were 12 parties. And from my point of the conversation, the city of Fife and the Puyallup tribe were included as parties to that agreement. And that is really where this concept of consultation and capital C consultation came, came to Fife. Um, and it's required anytime a tribe or local government considers a substantial action. Um, it's spelled out in the settlement agreement as well as technical documents associated with it. And in its simple, excuse me, substantial action first, let's talk about that. Um, as, mentioned, as Andrew mentioned, it's, it's anything that requires a public hearing and some. Um, so it, all of your you know, rezones, uh, GMA type actions, um, also into your subdivisions, shorelines, um, but also land use plans and amendments to your land use plans as well and environmental reviews. So there's kind of this, this gamut of what is considered a substantial action. The process for, for capital C consultation, again, I'm using that capital C as the, the legally minimum required consultation that you must have according to law or agreement. Um, according to the consultation process in the land settlement agreement, it works in both directions. The tribe could request it of the city, the city could request it of the tribe. And it's really just an attempt to resolve any differences before a decision is made on any substantial action. And at the end of that consultation process, the government with the decision-making authority retains that authority. I want to talk a little bit more about consultation and kind of the non-formal, non-legally binding sense. Um, that first bullet point up there kind of spells it out a little bit. It's the process of seeking, discussing, and considering the views of other participants and where feasible seeking agreement. Um, and that process I want to put into maybe a different light to help contextualize it a little bit more. I'm going out to lunch with friends on Friday. 
Um, we had a conversation, we talked, we speak out each other, we talked about where we wanted to go, and we ended up on a place to go have lunch. We didn't really consult with each other. We had a conversation about what we wanted to do and which path we wanted to move forward. So the, really the point of that is, is that consultation and coordinating with tribes, it can be built into just what you do in your day in and day out planning processes. But it may be more formally outlined with that capital C and outlining in state, federal law, and other applicable treaties and agreements. A lot of cities have been operating under treaties or land settlement agreement, and now we have some new requirements coming out of House Bill 1717 that um, Ben talked about earlier today. But consultation could also be conducted informally, and this is where you really get into the good stuff when we, we aren't doing the minimum required. We're really working together to create relationships. But overall, the goal of consultation is to further that government to government relationship, um, assuring that the mutual rights and respects and interests of each, uh, of each government as well as our obligations um, are met. When we talk about obligations, if you step back and take a look at what tribes and us as planners for cities and, and counties, um, what, we, what we're looking for at a very high level, we're looking for the same thing, health and happiness and prosperity of the people and protection of the environment. When you step back, we're kind of all going towards the same place. So um, I have three three basics. I have quotations because these are basics according according to me and, and what I've what I've seen working um, at the city of Fife for the last 14 years. First and foremost, it is about building relationships. You must build a unique relationship with your tribal partners. It is not the same relationship that you're going to have with the city up the hill or the county or the state for that matter. Tribes are not stakeholders. Tribes are sovereign nations, and there is a vast difference in how you coordinate and build relationships with sovereign nations versus stakeholders. Number two, you need to understand unique dynamics. Um, that local government to sovereign nation dynamic is a lot different. It, it is it is talking to a different country, for example. Think of it in that sense. It's talking to Germany, um, the good Germany, not the Nazi Germany. Um, and what when we talk about staff versus tribal council, there's there's another kind of unique dynamics in there. You should not expect staff to speak for tribal council. Um, you should not expect um, tribal council to speak for tribal members. Um, members also will not speak for the tribal council. There's some instances where the tribal council will speak on behalf of their members, but there is that self-determination as well within, within the tribe and their members and allowing the members to, to speak for themselves. And then also, obviously, the specific interests and concerns of, of different tribes, you know, where are their, where are their interests, where are their concerns. Um, Andrew mentioned, you know, working on a heat map with cultural resources. Cultural resources are obviously one of the biggest concerns for the number of tribes. And it is completely within their right and quite appropriate for them to kind of hold those, those exact locations of known cultural resources, hold them close to their chest. Um, you know, the, that information gets out there and all of a sudden you have a bunch of uh, Facebook archaeologists out there running around digging up and looking for valuable cultural resources that belong to your tribe or to your local tribe. And then the last point I would put up here is consultation, that capital C consultation, the legal minimum, um, that should be considered the absolute bare minimum. Um, and it's worth noting that it will probably get you bare minimum results or worse. Um, we as planners and working with our partners should aim for better coordination. As I mentioned, building relationships is is really the the key. It's it's the most important thing when we talk about uh, working and coordinating with your tribal partners. And it needs to start and happen outside of that legal minimum requirement of consultation. I'm not sure of too many relationships that started off and lasted on a good foot when attorneys were involved in the first meeting. There may be a couple of attorneys out there that are married to each other that will differ with me, but generally speaking, um, you have an attorney in the room at your first meeting, it's it's gonna get off on the wrong foot. Um, so it really means, means meeting informally, uh, meeting outside of, outside of the boardrooms, outside of city hall, outside of just normal business um, and having open and early and honest communication at all levels. Um, I understand for some bigger cities, it's probably hard for you as a staff planner to coordinate with your council to meet with the tribal council, but it is a building relationship exercise, not only at the staff level, but also at the council and the, the, the council levels. And those conversations need to be started off with understanding and you respect. It, it may not be advantageous for the first time that your council meets 
with the tribal council to dig into business and start asking for things. Um, if you are building a new friendship, um, you usually don't ask them to do something for you the first time you meet and start to get to know each other. So it is building that relationship. Um, and those strong foundational relationships, they will help work through tough issues. If you have a strong understanding of mutual respect and a relationship, and you build that relationship around the easy stuff, um, around SAB and Habitat, around open space, around critical areas, around coordinating and working together with or against sound transit, whatever, whatever your prerogative may be, you build that relationship around the easy stuff. And then when you have the hard stuff, such as reopening an at grade railroad crossing next to an elementary school, having those strong foundational relationships will, will make those tougher conversations just a little bit easier. Um, you have two ears and one mouth. The concept of proportionality comes into that bullet point as well. And I'll just leave it at that. And it truly is more than just checking a box. It requires ongoing communication with your tribal partners. So in practice, um, and you could kind of use this slide as a, as a choose your own adventure story, I guess, but the answer of what, when, and how starts off with, it depends. Um, obviously the what, when, and how you coordinate and communicate on a, on a permitting application that's a simple permit for a Starbucks or something is gonna be completely different on what, when, and how you coordinate for your 2024 periodic update uh, for an area-wide rezone. But there are, you know, notice of application, obviously that's something that needs to be to be coordinated and communicated. Um, that's going to pick up all of your environmental reviews, all of your shorelines, um, critical areas, subdivision, CUPs, variances, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of your long range planning work and your annual dockets, sub area plans, planned actions, area wide rezones, those should all definitely be coordinated with and communicated early with the tribes. Um, and then that bullet point at the bottom, the case by case, and this again gets back to building that unique relationship and having understandings of what will the tribe want to look at, what are those main concerns going to be. Um, we all know our SEPA exemptions are going up uh, year by year, it seems like. I think 200 units of multifamily is as much as you can exempt now. Um, if you're relying on SEPA notification to be your consultation process with with the tribe you're you're probably falling a little bit short and a little bit behind the ball game in terms of timing when we get into the when um, obviously the first bullet point as soon as possible and the last bullet point no surprises kind of sum everything up um, early enough to address fundamental issues you know if you're going to be authorizing doing budget authorizations for a for a large sub area plan and the vast majority of that is, is tribal trust or tribally owned property you absolutely should be having those conversations with the tribe before you get into that budget authorization and you know data data collection scoping it really depends on what the what the thing is that we're communicating about and how we communicate um, obviously email is pretty straightforward we have this new fancy thing called virtual meetings thanks to covid um, a phone call you know old school i guess if you want to or in persons i guess would be considered old school as well um, inviting an invitation to pre-app meetings, um, meetings with third-party um, agencies such as Sound Transit or WashDOT. Um, and those bottom two bullet points on the house side, you know, again, public notice, if you're relying just on that email that you send to all your neighboring cities and all the state agencies as well, if you're relying that on the only time that you're identifying or you know communicating to the tribe of something is upcoming, you're probably a little bit late in the game. Then when it comes to committees, that's always a great, great opportunity to, to get information, to get background, to get knowledge. But uh, I guess a word of caution on committees is be aware of, of who you're appointing, how they, how they relate in the tribe, and what you're expecting out of them. And what I mean by that is if you put a tribal member who owns property in the city on your committee, don't expect them to speak on behalf of the tribal council. Additionally, if you have a tribal council member on one of your committees, don't expect them to speak on behalf of the tribal council. So again, it gets back to understanding those unique dynamics of the, of the different governments. Quick bonus tip, I'm sure we've all run across this person, um, anonymous permit applicant. And the person I'm thinking of is probably developed in some of your cities as well. And you know, it's that classic complaint, but I don't wanna do a cultural resource survey. Um, and this is what I tell people, you know, I tell them, you know, yes, I agree with you. You have every right to develop your property consistent with the municipal code but you have no right to destroy or take irreplaceable resources belonging to the Puyallup tribe. And the city is obligated to ensure the protection of these resources. 
And then I can t tell them to consider it as an insurance policy. You know, if you don't go through a inadvertent uh, cultural resource survey and you don't have an inadvertent discovery plan and you end up finding something, um, your project is going to be stopped. It's going to take time. It's going to take money. And it's going to be smack dab in the middle of the construction season. Fife is wet. You can see the tide come and go if you dig a deep enough hole. And having a dead stop in the middle of construction season is not good for anybody. One of the benefits, um, besides just being the right thing to do and now being required to do it again at different scales, depending on where you're at in the state and which reservation you're you're associated with. Um, my number one benefit to me as a planner is the technical knowledge and expertise that the, the tribe has within their staff. Um, obviously, cultural resources, there are no more ex far more experts on cultural resources of the Puyallup tribe than the Puyallup tribe themselves. Um, Fisheries, environmental stewardship, planning, and transportation. I'll touch on that in coming slides when we talk about some of the projects. Um, but, you know, we're fortunate that the Puyallup Tribe has a fully staffed and an educated planning department. Um, I don't, can't speak for every tribe before they sit with the resources to be able to staff up some of those departments. Mutual partnerships. Um, everybody loves a good partnership, especially when you're talking about fun projects. Um, but there are some smarter projects that we can be able to do together. Larger projects that are more than just putting fish in a creek. Um, projects such as Chris, sorry to interrupt you. You're got, you've gotten really quiet. I don't know if there's an adjustment. Right now. Not able to hear you. How about now? Is that better? Yes, that's so much better. Thank you. I apologize. I was at partnerships. Um, obviously, there's a lot of great partnerships opportunities when it comes to, to projects and building things and working on plans. Um, everybody knows your grant application looks just a little bit shinier when you have more participants, more people in and supporting your, your application and the project that you're working on. Um, and then as I mentioned, as I mentioned, infrastructure is, is another another big area for partnerships. Uh, tribal will need access to water and sewer, um, and that could be a benefit to your local water and sewer service areas. And then it is economic development is another one. And then opportunities as a sovereign nation. Um, tribal nations have different access to different opportunities, resources, funding, and mechanisms to make stuff happen. Um, cities and municipalities and local governments also have different resources in different buckets. So if you're heading towards the same path on the same project, and you could merge and leverage your resources and mechanisms and funding opportunities. It gives you that much more possibility to move forward and make the end goal happen. Uh, some of the benefits, um, Andrew mentioned a lot of the, the fisheries work that has happened in the city of Fife. We have uh, three rivers, uh, the Puyallup River, the Wapato Creek, and the Haida Boast Creek. Um, those have all received vast amounts of attention from the Puyallup tribe and the fisheries department. Uh, the photo on the right there is the tribe uh, dumping, uh, planting spawning salmon into our Brookfield Gardens. It's the, the gem of the city's park system. The lower Wapato, Wapato culvert replacement was a very unique project in terms of coordination. Uh, the culvert ran underneath the city owned right away. And on the downstream side of that was the Port of Tacoma and Tribal Trust property. And on the upstream side of that was Tribal Trust property, but not only Tribal Trust property, it was some of those original allotments that I mentioned earlier. So there was a lot of opportunity to work through that project for a benefit for all. Um, and the Puyallup River, I don't think there's any any restoration work on the Puyallup that happens without Russ Ladley and the Puyallup Fisheries team being involved and having their input as well. Andrew mentioned working together um, on the the SR-167 project um, as it relates to kind of coordination and what happens on the reservation. Um, I'm going to give you a different light of it. It was a 150-acre riparian restoration project. Uh, that covers a lot of areas around that synonymous Fife curve on I-5. In Fife, we're a planning staff of three. We do not have a critical areas expert or a habitat expert on staff, and it's somewhat tedious to dig into these large JARPAs and large riparian restoration programs into that nitty-gritty detail. I'm not talking about 
um, replacement ratios and that sort of stuff, we could all do simple math and, and figure out those sorts of things. What I'm talking about is, do we need large woody debris or do we need small woody debris? Do we need turtle hummocks? How many? Do we have five large woody debris per channel? Kind of that nitty gritty on the ground habitat related stuff. And that's where the, the Puyallup Tribal Fisheries Department was involved with the riparian restoration program and its development from the get go. So it kind of provides a little bit of a backstop, if you will, into some technical uh, shortfallings that staff just don't have in, in a lot of smaller jurisdictions. The other one is uh, sound transit in the city, the city center effort that we're working on. Uh, this purple line coming down th from Federal Way and around that Fife curb um, and landing smack dab on, on the north side of this purple outline, which is our city center planned action area. Um, that is a city, it's our center of local importance, which is the, the precessor to a countywide center, which then obviously the next step from there is a regional center under vision. We are one of the one of the only station locations in the Sound Transit TDLE line to have a single preferred station alternative, and that is due in no small part to the to the, the coordination between the City of Fife and Sound and the Puyallup Tribe in working, we'll call it working with Sound Transit at this point in time. Um, but it, it goes not only to the, the tribe and their staff in terms of cultural resource experts, but really a lot of planning IQ and you know knowledge about technical analysis, site design, um, transportation, and TOD. Again, the tribe has a vast interest in this area as well. Um, so their interest is very similar to ours in making this city center and kind of this area around the new Sound Transit Station a, a large success. When it comes to economic benefits, uh, there are quite a few. Uh, there is the brand new Emerald Queen Casino in Tacoma, but there is also the Emerald Queen Casino and Hotel in Fife, a bit smaller of a facility, but they do have a large um, banquet hall and a large um, area for conferences as well. And they're sponsored to a lot of our community events, our Harvest Festival, the Emerald Queen Casino, Casino was the number one sponsor, and they continue to sponsor some of our kind of, kind of feel good community neighborhood uh, type events. Uh, we all, Salish Cancer Center is fairly new and it's a, a fairly large facility in the city of Fife and Marine View Ventures is the economic development arm of the Puyallup tribe and uh, Tahoma Market I think there's three or maybe four of them in Fife uh, more than that in in the reservational boundary for sure um, and unless you're doing the Fred Meyer five times fuel up Friday bonus points you're probably going to find the cheapest gas at the Tahoma Market. And then last and definitely not least is the new Amazon Fulfillment Center, which was built in the city of Fife, completely on tribal trust property. Um, and the city of Fife partnered in, you know, providing utilities, um, providing access to the road system. And it was an extremely large project. It provided a number of host of jobs to the city, help build out some of our, you know, infrastructure in terms of looping water systems and stuff like that. And it is worth noting that the Amazon facility was one of those large projects where, you know, quote unquote, formal consultation was requested of the tribe to make sure we, we were, the city and the, uh, and the tribe were on similar pages moving forward through that development. With that, I would encourage um, a few kind of key takeaways, and I apologize if I, if I got quiet in that presentation, but really starting off with, with this concept of time immemorial, tribal people and the tribal nations have been here for a long, long time. There are a lot of unique dynamics that have really only popped up since settlement of these lands. Um, consultation in a land use process is the minimum requirement. We have some new kind of minimums, if you will, under House Bill 1717, but really ongoing coordination and communication is better than just that bare minimum requirement. And if you want to achieve best outcomes and best results, you really need to build unique relationships that are based on mutual respect and understanding. And coordinating all planning efforts, big and small, you know, everything from planting fish to building a building a warehouse, uh, coordinating your planning efforts and good things can and will come. So thank you for your time today. Um, I believe I'm handing it off to Erica Harris now. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate that. Hopefully. You'll see my full screen in a moment. I'll go back to this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks again, Chris. Um, 
My name is Erica Harris. I'm a planner in the Growth Management Group at Puget Sound Regional Council, and I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Suquamish and Muckleshoot tribes. Uh, Chris and Andrew provided some really great, rich examples of coordination between their tribe and city. I'm going to zoom out a bit uh, because we have nine fe federally recognized tribes in our four county central Puget Sound region. And each, each tribe is a unique sovereign nation and they have unique needs and interests. Um, so you'll hear that um, a lot of the um, guidance that we're providing is to really um, kind of uh, work on the building relationships. And, and um, you heard that earlier too, but um, that was what we heard loud and clear from our tribes. So for a long time, PSRC has been encouraging tribes to be involved in Puget Sound Regional Council. We uh, send yearly invitations to become members. And as you can see from the asterisks there, we, um, we do have quite a few tribes as members. And when they're formal members, um, they are welcome to be on our boards and committees. And so we really encourage the tribes to um, have their voices at PSRC. Um, and probably because of that, Vision 2050 uh, has even more emphasis on coordination with tribes and building in uh, tribal interests into our regional planning. Um, you can see this um, multi-county planning policy here is uh, kind of the overarching policy that encourages coordination with, with tribes in both regional and local planning um, and looking at making sure that we have recognized the mutual benefits and impacts that can happen from growth. And there are other uh, multi-county planning policies that are in Vision 2050 around tribes and their interests. So before I jump into our guidance document, I wanted to make sure you knew that we have a tribes webpage. It has information on tribes in the region. Um, that guidance document lives there, um, has other resources such as the treaties, um, and that's the where the web page is there. So we developed this guidance document with um, our tribes in the region, and we really appreciate their input. Um, so thank you to Andrew and all the other um, tribal uh, staff planners who have helped uh, with this. Um, I do want to say that it's sort of a high level document reflecting that we do have nine unique uh, tribes and uh, we want to make sure that the focus is really on building these relationships so you understand their, their unique interests. Um, so we heard that it's important to build those relationships early and also make them ongoing. Um, and you heard lots of great examples from um, earlier, so I don't need to get into that too much. Um, I think you've heard that quite a bit now. Um, the guidance document also talks about tribal treaty rights, which you heard for, from Andrew about, um, but there's a great um, document that we link to from the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission that does a great job of explaining it. And um, we have some high level considerations um, for land use, the environment, cultural resources, and economic development um, that are based on policies in Vision 2050. So the, the land use policy really focuses on um, avoiding encroachment and impacts to tribal reservations, um, cultural resources, uh, looks at protecting those cultural resources, which you've heard about earlier. Uh, I did want to focus in the, on the environmental section because it actually has um, kind of it's more overarching and includes uh, regional coordination and also transportation. Uh, we have a very specific policy on um, working on uh, salmon recovery, Puget Sound recovery. Uh, and uh, working on stormwater issues and uh, removing those fish passage barriers. A lot of those are tied to transportation facilities. So um, that's really a good place, that transportation element to, to um, look at that policy. And then finally, we have some best practices, which I'll show you here. Uh, we have um, one example of the PLF tribe working with the city of Tacoma on their tide flat subarea plan. Um, the city added a policy um, on the right of first refusal for the tribe uh, when they're surplus property. Another good example is the Tulalip and Stiligwabish tribes working with Snohomish County and other partners on their sustainable land strategy that works on coordinating fish farm and flood management efforts. The Suquamish tribe in Kitsap County are working on a regional stormwater facility. 
um, they that will be on the Suquamish tribe. And you heard a little bit about this Tacoma to uh, Puyallup Regional Trail that the Puyallup tribe worked on with Pierce County, Washdot, and the cities of Tacoma, Fife, and Puyallup. Kitsap County and Pierce County have actually have countywide planning policies with chapters on working with tribal governments. And you heard a, a bunch of great examples from Fife and the Puyallup tribe. Um, so you'll see that presentation later if you want to refer to those. I also wanted to give you a sneak preview on um, a guidance document we'll be put, putting together on integrating stormwater solutions into comprehensive plans. Um, this is an important strategy for Puget Sound recovery because as you probably know, uh, stormwater is the biggest contributor to pollution in Puget Sound and its tributaries. So uh, it's terribly important that that gets addressed um, and throughout our comprehensive plan, including our land use, natural resources, transportation, parks and recreation, and public services and utilities elements. Um, so just, just one example of that, um, you've probably heard me talk about stormwater parks before. Those are regional stormwater retrofit facilities that also have a recreation component. So you can address that in both the recreation element as well as um, some of these other elements like public services and utilities. Um, so th that's just one example of, of the kinds of policies and uh, programs you might see in that. Um, so one last tip before I hand it off. Um, I did hear um, from one tribe from uh, that it's really helpful to not only get letters from jurisdictions, but also um, to copy staff and um, council members on email so that you can facilitate, uh, they can facilitate communication. It's really hard to pass along a letter quickly. So one last quick trip and I'll hand it off to Liz for the question and answer. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to everyone for um, those excellent presentations. Uh, we have a few questions uh, in the Q&A, but please feel free to um, submit some more if, if, as they come up to you. Um, I think maybe this is a good question for Andrew, but perhaps Benjamin to answer. Um, so what are ceded lands? Uh, is that the same as trust lands, um, other parcels owned by the tribe? Yeah, I'll jump, to, jump in. Um, ceded lands are uh, historical lands that tribes um, owned, and uh, they were largely ceded through, the, uh, through treaties although there are some tribes who didn't sign treaties and their lands were seized by the U.S. government, um, but they still had lands that were ultimately part of their traditional territory and ceded. Um, trust lands are lands that are held uh, in uh, trust, uh, the, the, the title of the land is held in trust by the federal government for uh, the tribe. Uh, being the beneficiary of those lands. And so those are, uh, you can construe them as federal level lands, similar to other federal lands like military bases, as an, an example. Uh, but they are they are lands that are administered by the tribe um, and the title is owned by the federal government. Great, thanks so much. Um, I think this is a, probably a good question for um, Benjamin referring to uh, GMA. So does RCW 3670A.040, this is the who must plan section of GMA, uh, refer to cities as well as counties, um, or does a county sign an MOU and all cities must follow it? So this section, so this is subsection eight in 040, and it does call out cities as well as counties. So I, I'd encourage you to go take a look, but basically it says a federally recognized Indian tribe may voluntarily choose to participate in the county or regional planning process and coordinate with the county and cities that are either required to comply with the provisions, basically uh, identifies fully planning jurisdictions. So I would say um, my expectation on this would be uh, a tribe would enter in with individual uh, memorandum of agreement with local governments. Um, I don't think it would be they enter in with the county and uh, the city is obliged to uh, follow that along with that. I think they would be independent from one another. 
Great. Um, I think this is a question that I think anyone should feel free to jump in and answer. Um, so we amend our zoning code annually. Should we plan on scheduling meetings with the tribal councils for all the tribes having an interest in the city? We currently consult, uh, consult at the technical level with the THPOs for the eight tribes. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, one of the best ways to sort of facilitate this initial communication, particularly on a planning level with tribes, is to send um, a letter to the tribe addressed to the tribal chairman and uh, or, or chairwoman or whoever their, uh, you know, main uh, appointed leader of their council is. And as part of that, uh, invite the tribe to whatever the the planning process that you're you're interested in. It may come. It may be at a level where they would like to participate from a government to government. That means like a council to your council level. It may be a level that uh, is uh, typically staff to staff, uh, and then there might be a report out. Um, each tribe is going to want to engage in a different way. Um, depending on what the subject matter is, but uh, largely uh, sending a letter. Um, hopefully, you have a contact at the tribe that you can sort of CC on the letter to, you know, make them make sure that they're they know that this letter is is coming and and it's you know CC to them so that they know that's arrived. And largely, then the tribe, um, the tribal staff, will be able to help facilitate some sort of response or involvement in the process. We frequently get what are called dear tribal leader letters uh, sent to us. Um, our council, um, you know, sometimes participates, but largely leaves a lot of the planning work to staff. And um, and then we'll, uh, you know, if there are any fruits of that of that planning process, we typically report out to our council on um, what the development is uh, in working with one of the local municipalities. Chris, do you want to jump in there too, or? No, I can't really add too much to that answer. My answer is just simply going to be yes, and it really depends on that unique relationship. So Andrew really spelled it out well. Right. Um, I'm going to maybe just ask the, the next question a little bit more broadly. I think Andrew kind of covered this, but um, just maybe any general advice about um, how, how to identify sort of who to contact about comprehensive planning at any of the tribes. Um, well, I know this particular question is very uh, specific to the Muckleshoot tribe, and I will just first say that the, the Muckleshoot tribe director is uh, uh, Kong Thrips in Krapicha, um, and so there is a specific planner, planning director at the Muckleshoot tribe that you can get in contact with. Um, a lot of planning department, city planning departments, county planning departments are typically that they get very laser focused on the one relationship that they might have, which might be like, uh, you know, working specifically with a cultural resource uh, typo uh, or the natural resource folks. Um, there's a diverse number of departments, just like in city and county government, um, depending on you, you know, uh, 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 what tribe you're dealing with that um, uh, if you have those contacts, you should you should reach out and say, hey, you know, we're doing a periodic update of our comprehensive plan. I know I've always talked to you for, you know, cultural resources and would definitely want to invite you to that process. But we're wondering if the tribe has a planning department, planning director. We would love to engage on a policy to policy level with uh, the tribe on the development of that. And um, you know, some tribes have those departments. Some tribes have individuals who are both the planning director, the the fire department. The you know, they serve several different roles. Uh, and so, um, you, you know, I would reach out to those individuals that you do have that sort of sticky relationship with, and and uh, see. Uh, how how you can get the tribe involved in that work because just like uh, each uh, county and city government has their very their niche departments in in uh, tribes that will be able to address um, and and potentially participate in a lot of your uh, planning processes. Great. Uh, I think we've reached the end of our of our questions in our Q and A box. Um, so I might uh, turn it back to Maggie to wrap us up. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you for those who have attended today, as well as to our 
fantastic speakers for sharing their their knowledge with us. Um, we're going to launch our last set of poll questions. This is the first one is just to kind of get a feeling. How are you feeling after the workshop? Um, and then we also have an open ended box. Any feedback for us specifically on today's webinar or um, webinars we're doing as part of our passport series. You can also always email PSRC at our plan review email if you have any questions um, on the planning process. Uh, the recording for today's session will be available on our website and we'll send it out to everyone. Once it's there, we'll do some editing to it and post it to our YouTube. So it will probably take a few days to get up there. Um, and then when today's webinar ends, we will it will automatically launch our Title VI survey to you. This is really a survey to with some demographic questions so we have a better understanding of who is attending our events. Um, so we would really appreciate if you fill out that survey. And thank you so much for attending. We'll leave the questions up for another minute or so, um, and then we will end the webinar.